So in this session, the discussion will focus on how development, developing and transitioning countries like the Philippines can move out of the middle income trap through investments and innovation in natural resource management and climate change response. So by now and from our discussions this morning, if you were around, many of us have become familiar with how natural disasters are unsettling people's lives, driving distress, and deepening divides in our societies. We also have observed how natural resource management and climate change actions are intertwined and that doing nothing can be a catastrophic for the economy. So the topic on natural resource use, climate change, and social justice uh, is considered a key pillar to achieve inclusive growth by growing the middle class and making them resilient. I think this is one of the key messages in this morning's uh, 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 discussion. So we are honored to have with us four distinguished speakers representing uh, different uh, agencies. We will first hear from our main speaker, Dr. Selva Ramachadran, who will set the context and his reflections for the session. Then we will hear from our distinguished experts, their own narratives and perspectives on the topic. So, but before we begin, some reminders. Please set your phones on silent mode. Please minimize moving in and out of the room while the discussion is ongoing. Coffee will be served actually uh, later at the outside this room. We invite you to actively engage in these discussions. We will have a Q&A uh, after we hear from our speakers and discussants. So please prepare your questions. So let me proceed uh, to introducing our main speaker. So, doc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Actually, I actually I cut it short, so you see a lot of. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I will just mention your uh, relevant to this uh, session. So, Dr. Selva Ramachadran is the UNDP Philippines represent, uh, resident representative, and she brings to this session 28 years of. Uh, experience with UNDP in the Asia Pacific region, Central Asia, Arab states, as well as global, regional, country level workings on uh, broad issues of sustainable development. So, Dr. Selva holds a PhD in Asian and International St Studies from Griffith, Griffith University, Brisbane, Australia. Or is yours, Dr. Selva? Uh, Mike, I, I guess so. Eh? Okay, I can sit, I can stand. Anyway, room temperature first. How people are doing? I know it's all not easy after lunch eh, to hold uh, ourselves. I hope I will not be too boring. Uh, if it's, I see if uh, the faces are not uh, overly engaging, I'll probably cut short. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I will follow the instruction given to me by the organizers. Uh, they requested me to speak 15 to 20 minutes. I'll keep it within that uh, limit. And then the request uh, to me was to, you know, to give more glo global perspective. Because while we look at Philippines per se, uh, that was a request to give a, a bit global perspective. So uh, that's what uh, I will do. Can we go to our slide? OK, so uh, bas very briefly, I'll cover these th uh, three things in the context of the topic uh, of the uh, conference and the session one. Eh? I'll give some uh, uh, facts and figures on nature and climate. And I think uh, it's very important uh, uh, to look at the global perspective, global context on the area that was we are going to speak. And then my own reflection on way forwards. And maybe that's where I also bring a little bit of experience of my working duty stations elsewhere. Now 28 years, jump to 30 years now. So I see my CV, my bio is old, 30 years in UNDP, and I've been in, a, in difficult countries, eh? uh, to name few, Yemen, very difficult place, Libya, uh, Sudan, this, uh, and of course I worked in the early days in Kazakhstan, Malaysia, I'm a Malaysian. Anyway, to start with, uh, some facts and uh, figures on the nature. Uh, 
uh, most of you know, but I think it's important that we, we look at some of the global pictures. Uh, just to summarize, globally 10 million hectares of deforestation occur every year. To put it in a geographical context, that is the size of Portugal. Every year, the size of Portugal is deforestated. I think that's not an achievement. The rate of reforestation is very small. If there's deforestation, then there's also reforestation, but doesn't correspond to the rate of deforestation. Uh, and nearly 95% of deforestation occurs in the tropics. That means in our region, we can see active deforestation as well. In just 50 years, since 1970, 35% of the world's wetlands have been lost. We call the wetlands as a lung of the world. So the lungs of the world has been affected. It's no joke, huh? 35% within the span of 50 years. The ocean is already warmer, more acidic and less productive. Over 50% of the world's coral reefs have died in the last 30 years. And we see that in the Philippines as well. And Malaysia, in my own country, is a big problem. An estimated 20 million metric tons of pl plastic litter ends up in the environment every year. Plastic pollution affects all land, fresh water, and marine ecosystem. And of course, plastic pollution is also an important issue for Philippines. Eh? Uh, we can see a lot of uh, plastics en end up in the, in the ocean as well. Around 7 million people die every year from, expo e uh, from exposure to polluted air. And these are not uh, very good statistics, but this is the fact. This is for the global level. And uh, uh, to give a little bit more, uh, next slide, to give a little bit more, uh, no, previous slide, the state of uh, planet. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just want, I think it's very important. I don't want to be negative, but I think to put the perspective. And this particular thing, I took it from the Secretary General's uh, speech. So not to say I plagiarize, but I think it's important to amplify the messages that come from the global uh, level, particularly from the UN Secretary General. Uh, humanity, he says, humanity is waging war on nature. Nature always strikes back, and we can see that. And it is already doing so with growing force and fury. Biodiversity is collapsing. One million species are at risk of extinction. Ecosystems are disappearing before our eyes. The fallout of the assault on our planet is impending our efforts to eliminate poverty and imperiling food security, food security. And forcing people from their homes and rocking the foundations of peace and security as people are displaced and vital resources depleted. Human activities are at the root of our, dis our descent toward chaos, but that means human action can help to solve it. If we create the problem, we can also help to solve it. Nature needs to bail out, and humans need to make peace with the nature. And this is a quote from the UN Secretary General. So let's look at the positive trend. This is a little bit of a negative uh, connotation that I've given. But there the are positive uh, things also coming up, and some of the assessment also shows uh, that we can go into that direction. Nature-based solutions could provide one-third of net reduction in green greenhouse gas emissions required to meet the Paris uh, Agreement goals. Renewable energy is getting cheaper and cheaper as we go on, and there's a huge potential for us to move to renew renewable energy. Bold climate action could deliver 26 trillion in economic benefits by 2030. That's Agenda 2030 as well. And switching to clean economy could produce over 65 million new low carbon jobs. And an investment of 1.8 trillion from 2020 to 2030 in adaptation could generate 7.1 trillion in total net benefits. While these are global statistics, I see whenever I go for meetings in Philippines, I see similar discussion coming up in Philippines, eh? in the similar direction uh, that the Philippines want to move. And we also see the aspiration of Philippines to become an upper middle income country. And some of the issues that I may highlight for other countries is applicable to Philippines as well. So now uh, let me move to the global context and a big, little bit of a uh, big picture. Again, to start with a little bit of uh, uh, observation. The world is facing a very uncertain times. So I don't think so you're going to argue with me on that. <laughs> Due to 
a confluence of factors, including destabilizing planetary pressure, as we discussed earlier, growing inequalities, societal transformation, and polarization. Polarization becoming a key issue <laughs> in the whole of world. Uh, these factors are intersecting in, com in a complex ways, unsettling people's life, driving distress, and deepening divides in our societies, making it harder to, for us to come together at a time when we need to solve the most. Even when people go, as we speak, the UN, sec uh, UN uh, 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 meeting is happening. Eh? This is the General Assembly is going on. Can people come together, meet eye to eye in any issue? It's becoming difficult, even at the UN General Assembly. The world has gone <laughs> that direction, eh? quite polarized. Okay, just since this uh, uh, meeting is more about uh, uh, middle income countries, just a bit uh, on middle income countries, around 75% of the world's population, 75% uh, of the world population, and 62% of the world's poor live in middle income country. When 70% is concentrated, the action has to be the largest concentration of population, right? And Asia Pacific is also uh, host for the large uh, population size of middle income country. Asia Pacific is a dynamic region and has made significant progress to improve the health and well being of its population by lifting billions of people out of poverty. However, economic growth has been based on unsustainable models of development leading to the region accounting for more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions and two-thirds of premature death due to air pollution and causing a quarter of endemic species in the region to face risk of extinction. If business continues as usual, the ongoing deterioration of our environment will exacerbate risk and vulnerabilities, potentially causing irreversible environmental damage. So I'm putting middle-income country in perspective. Eh? Uh, and some of the issues Philippines do well, some of the issues Philippines has share the same uh, challenges as well. Uh, so uh, over the last decades, the world also has experienced consequences of climate change more than ever. I think this is important for me to stress this point. Eh? Uh, sometimes uh, we talk about Natural environment is climate change is connected to natural environment is something different. I think everything is connected these days. Is climate change is a separate issue? Is it a development issue? For me, climate change is a key development issue, right? So I think we need to look at things in perspective. Over the last uh, decade, the world has experienced the consequences of climate change more than ever, as the rising temperature fuel environmental degradation, natural disasters and weather extreme, which again leads to food and water insecurity, over three billion people are living in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change. So in the context, if you look at all the COP discussion, everybody is talking about 1.5 degree, the importance of keeping uh, uh, the climate uh, uh, warming within 1.5 degrees. So what is all the fuss about 1.5 degrees? We talk about it, but what's so important? What's the fuss about it, right? Because our planet, is a mass of a complex connected system. We are not talking about an individual country. We are talking about the whole planet. And every fraction of a degree of global heating counts. The difference between 1.5 degree and 2 degree could be the difference between extinction and survival of some small island states and coastal communities. Now that's a real feeling, uh, the real feeling in the uh, Pacific countries. Eh? The difference between minimizing climate chaos or crossing dangerous tipping points, 1.5 degrees is not a target, it's not a goal, it's a physical uh, uh, limit. The cost of the chaos is hitting people where it hurts, from supply chains severe to rising prices, mounting food insecurity and un uninsurable homes and business. As we speak, you can see eh, the flood situation in Europe in Africa. Even this year when uh, uh, we can see when people went to Hajj, the temperature, uh, temperature rise had an enormous impact. So schools are being closed, not because of uh, a COVID pandemic alone, with the climate uh, change, with the rising temperature. So it's a real issue all over the world. So I, I also wanted to uh, uh, highlight a little bit on the big picture on uh, SDGs. Recent uh, research, including the latest IPP reports, has further confirmed that ambitious climate action is urgent. 
Despite the urgency of this complex crisis, the latest SDG report sounds the alarm that we are dangerously off track in achieving the SDGs and we urgently need to address these concerns. Especially this is the case for SDG 13, 14 and 15. Reason Human Development Report of UNDP also alluding to this uh, particular observation. Funding and investments are crucial to accomplish the SDGs, yet financing gap to finance the SDGs is estimated at more than USD 3.7 trillion. 3.7 trillion. We need, a, a, we need to set a new course of society, just low carbon and climate resilient, that would help the whole world in addressing the collective issues. So with this context, now let me uh, go into straight away, eh? also with the time limitation, go into reflections and the way forward. And the reflections and way forward is from a broader perspective. I'm not speaking anything on Philippines here. It's a broader perspective. So one, number one, promoting an inclusive approach to fair, greener transition is very important. Uh, we are seeing seismic changes of our societies, economies, and planets as countries are identifying ways through which to transition to more <coughs> green economies. Developing and implementing impactful policies or interventions require understanding and navigating different interests and priorities which needs to be supported by effective, agile, and adaptive institutions. Government systems and engagement with civil society movements as well as business to promote and protect economic and social rights. The importance of such a transformation is increasingly recognized by government worldwide as they cite just transition principle in their short and long-term plans. 69% of climate promised countries that submitted new updated NDCs have raised the ambition on different targets. And next year, 2025, will mark the 10-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. The meeting COP will take place in Brazil marks a critical moment in the collective fight against climate change. Countries are expected to submit revised nationally determined contribution that outline their sovereign commitment to climate action under Paris Agreement. And Philippines is also doing, and in fact, we are also part of the discussion to help Philippines. I think the level of ambition, commitment on NDCs is critically important. As such, for me, the next two years stand as one of the best chances we have as international community to ensure warming stays under 1.5. And we know the importance of 1.5. Okay. Closer? Okay. Okay, number two, role of technology. Uh, there are many ways in which technology can help to reduce impacts of climate change. Energy efficiency technology can help us to use less energy, while renewable energy and technologies can help us to generate clean emission from free, uh, free electricity. The cost of renewable energy, as I mentioned, getting cheaper and cheaper. Transportation is another area where technology can, be, can make a big difference. Electric vehicles is one uh, area into that. Technology, early warning systems can also help us to monitor and predict the impacts of climate change so that we can take steps to protect vulnerable communities and infrastructure. And we can go on and on. The role of technology is key. While role of technology is key, including cutting edge types, have a role to play in just transition in middle income countries, they should not be viewed in panacea. And the risk they introduce in middle income countries, including job displacement, threats to data privacy, and enhanced socioeconomic inequality should, not, should be better understood and anticipated and mitigated. I think we, we have to be mindful on that. Huh? Otherwise, uh, this can have uh, unintended consequences. Three, investing in data for policy making. The Agenda 2030 calls for data revolution, yet we are still far from meeting the data requirements called for measuring the SDGs. Investing in national statistical capacities and working in partnership across different data producers to generate the evidence needed for better policies and better targeting of development intervention for marginalized group is critical. I think most of the developing countries are facing the problem. Four, building trust through strengthening integrity. The 2022 Edelman Trust Barometer, which surveys people from 28 countries, 
notes that 66% of the respondents believe that their governments misled them. By the way, Philippines is not part of these 28 countries. Eh? These are other countries. With falling trust in institutions and governance leaders, we need to understand what it will take to address this to rebuild trust in institutions and reverse the increasing polarization. Investing in integrity from combating corruption, addressing illicit financial flaws, flows and strengthening economic governance is a core necessity. Five, bridging the financial divide. Put global finance to work for climate. As highlighted by the 2023 Financing for Sustainable Development report, the finance divide between developed and developing countries has worsened and risk fueling a long-lasting global divergence in sustainable development. It is estimated some 60% of poorest countries are either at high risk of, of or already in debt distress, while nearly a third of middle-income countries are at high risk of physical crisis. High debt burdens and rapidly rising service, servicing costs are eroding the fiscal space that countries need to recover from crisis, fulfill obligation to citizens, and invest in sustainable development. As called for in the UN SDG stimulus plan, reiterated during the recent financing for development forum, addressing debt burdens and vulnerability and expanding affordable finance for developing countries are overriding priorities. Right? A thorough reform of the international financial architecture is needed to ensure that finance can be delivered at scale and sustainability where it is most needed. In particular, there is a scope to boost lending by multilateral development banks, align multilateral development banks' business models within the SDG and further leverage their role in monitoring private investment. Having said that, more and more we are seeing uh, problems and challenges of countries has to be solved by themselves. Their own local domestic uh, resource mobilization to address uh, the issues becomes key beside loans from uh, uh, multi multilateral development banks. Six, protect the vulnerable. This is critically important. And it's also very important for Philippines. Eh? Uh, we are in the race against time to adapt to a rapidly changing climate. So adaptation must, be, must not be forgotten. And it's a key. I'm glad Philippines is also going to host the loss and damage fund. We hope more emphasis will be given on the adaptation. And I can't go into detail as my, our uh, uh, moderators are already flashing the sign. I have two more minutes. Seven, a last one before I conclude. Revisiting prosperity metrics. I think for me this is very important. Eh? This is critical to help secure pathways towards a just and sustainable future for all. Gross domestic product, GDP, has been far too long the dominant benchmark for evaluating prosperity. Yet in many countries, high GDP growth failed to translate into enough jobs and uh, to reduce poverty. You see what's happening in uh, Bangladesh. High growth, but you have a crisis because no uh, jobs, right? Uh, GDP-centered policies have not closed gaps in income, human development, and opportunity. It is estimated that closing the global gender gap now would take almost under 35 years. I can't imagine. So anyway revisiting the whole prosperity metrics and look at uh, 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 new ways of uh, uh, measuring the importance of pros prosperity is important. Uh, I will probably, given the interest of time, straight go into conclusion. I think probably that will open up space for our, our, our other panelists to discuss. So for me to conclude, there's a need to act with agency and hope. And we have a lot of hope, huh? I, and, and nothing is negative. The other day I was watching a TikTok, and the TikTok says, you know, uh, there's heaven after death. And the TikTok, somebody in the TikTok was asking, why aren't we looking at the heaven? We are living in the heaven. We always think of heaven after death. This is a heaven if we want to make this as heaven, right? So we understand the magnitude of the challenge in, in front of us, and we have a range of tools and solutions Many that I believe we will discuss uh, in the meeting. We need to understand now how we get from solutions to actions 
how we build political will for change, how we drive collective action and make progress towards common goals to address climate change and achieve more equitable and inclusive development outcomes for all. We cannot go back to the old normal of inequality, injustice, and Hitler's nominion over the earth. Instead, we must step towards a safer, more sustainable and equitable path. The door is open, the solutions are there. Collectively, we can contribute towards the solution. With that, I end uh, my <laughs> speech or my introduction. Thank you. I hope I kept to the time limit. Yeah, thank you for that uh, comprehensive reflection of the elements of climate change. Um, let me now, moving forward, let me now uh, um, move to our discuss discussants on, uh, and let's hear their reflections as well on this issue of uh, uh, climate change, natural resources, and social justice. So first I call on Dr. Rodel Lasco. He is a seasoned natural resources and environmental researcher and has more than 40 years of experience on issues related to natural resources conservation, climate change, and land degradation. He is uh, the author of several reports of the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and a co-winner of the Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize in, in 2007. So uh, he is currently the executive director of the Oscar Lopez Center, a private foundation whose mission is to discover science-based solution for climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So Dr. Lask. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator. And uh, of course, it's the IPCC who won the award. But there's also the IPCC of the... So I am basically an academic, but at the same time heading a civil society organization. And so I'll talk about uh, coming from these two perspectives. And let's just have the uh, uh, PowerPoint here. So the first half of my talk will be a bit more me talking as a scientist, IPCC author, but the next half will be more of what can we do in terms of, uh, in my case, the civil society perspective. All right. Anyway, so just uh, sort of highlighting the point uh, made earlier by Selva about, and even perhaps this morning, about uh, the dire straits we are in as a result of climate change. Uh, recent, in fact, very recent, just July 2024, as many of you may have been aware, we hit the highest ever uh, global surface, you know, daily temperature. That was in July 2024. So this is really a, a big problem and challenge for all of humanity. And uh, sort of related to that, in the Philippines, uh, uh, because one of the challenges is how do we attribute certain changes to climate change as opposed to just seasonal variability, annual variability. And so this group, uh, the World uh, Weather Attribution, mainly composed of climate or IPCC climate scientists, recently uh, conducted a study, including the Philippines, fortunately, showing that the last heat wave, you remember the heat wave where we had school closures, uh, Selva, the one you were alluding to earlier? Well, they showed very conclusively that that heat wave two weeks uh, or a few months ago was more than a degree centigrade warmer because of climate change. In other words, without climate change, it, it would have been more than one degree cooler. And moving forward, we will have even more or even higher uh, temperatures. 1.5 was mentioned, two degrees uh, as well. And even more frighteningly, perhaps, for the Philippines, Without climate change, this is the same study by uh, Zakaria, Zakaria et al. And uh, without climate change, that kind of heat wave that we experience would not have happened. There's zero probability of that happening. But now because of climate change, it is one in 10 year event 
So that kind of uh, heat wave we could expect to happen one every 10 years. But with a two degree warming, and again, that's a threshold that we're looking uh, after, it will become a one in two. So every other year, we will have that kind of uh, super hot uh, weeks. These are, these are two week, uh, 15 day uh, heat wave you know, uh, that we experienced uh, last summer here in the Philippines. So these uh, you know, re more recent scientific findings uh, not even in the IPCC report, because our report was 2022 and 2023, uh, all of these show that we really need to be concerned in terms of uh, climate change. Now, m moving sort of uh, transitioning to my second half of the talk, is uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, graphic from an another study, this is by Portinga and others uh, last year, showing how do we change uh, you know, the behavior, the minds and behavior of people, uh, especially in terms of uh, climate engagement. And very sort of, uh, I think, relevant to, to us. Well, we have to influence their beliefs, what they believe in, okay? And this is where for science and facts come in. But there's more. It's not just spewing or dumping, you know, a ton of uh, data and information to people, but they must see that there's some risks to them. And again, our previous speaker showed some of those risks. But even beyond, we have to touch their emotions. You know? So it, it's not just simple, uh, like as a scientist, you know, I generate data, information, pass it to people, and we expect them to act. There is this uh, multi-layered kind of uh, uh, complexity or factors that influence whether people will act or not. So. Bearing this in mind, what are we doing in the center? Well, in the Oscar M. Lopez Center, again, just to illustrate, this is for illustrative purposes, purposes only, I'm not saying all of us should do this, but what I'm trying to show is civil society organizations, NGOs, uh, can do something and make a difference. So for example, one of the things uh, we noticed by my colleagues who are also in the IPCC is that there's no national level IPCC type of reports. And so about more than five years ago, we started with a bunch of other IPCC authors producing our own Philippines version of the IPCC report. So we released the first one, 2016, 2017, 2018, and all of these reports, this, as you know, correspond to the IPCC three working groups, one, two, and three. So the first is climate science, working group two is adaptation, impacts and adaptation, and three is mitigation or sort of greenhouse gases and things like those. And so we just attempted to do this and voluntarily, just like the IPCC, you know, we did not really pay anything. Uh, and these are the top scientists, climate scientists, natural social scientists in the Philippines. And they, uh, did, you know, donated their time uh, to be able to do this. And I'm happy to report to you that even beyond that, we are now in the cusp, literally as I speak, we are hopefully publishing the first version of the cycle to report, which is... By the way, all our products are freely downloadable from our website, and we don't sell anything. We just distribute this freely to the public. So this is our attempt. So this is coming, you know, physical science, uh, 10 minutes left. So, uh, and uh, the, hopefully in the next few weeks, we will come up with the mitigation, working group three. Working group two is a bit delayed. Again, these are just top, our top scientists volunteering their time. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to release all of these reports one after another uh, in the next few weeks. So this is more of trying to influence perhaps more of the belief, side, or sorry, more of the uh, factual, yeah, the belief, you know, more of the factual side uh, that there's science out there and what is the science telling uh, our policymakers, you know, our decision makers. So this is, uh, uh, we're proud that of course we're doing this kind of work. And uh, so now moving on to a bit more uh, you might say to the decision makers and uh, and shakers and movers, uh, the center is also sponsoring what we call legacy lecture. Uh, initially, we started with the uh, businesses, the business sector, but we hope to also focus on the SMS and these, or the small and medium enterprises as well. So again, this is trying to bring the you know the belief, the information to more of risk uh, risk uh, uh, assessment or risk. Uh, the level of risks as faced by certain sectors of society. 
And then even moving more, hopefully to touch the emotions, we started delving into film, filmmaking, you know, supporting filmmakers and the youth initially. And uh, well, for example, in this one, uh, we partnered with Samsung and all of the films were, were shot with a cell phone, you know, albeit of course Samsung high-end cell phone. But in this year's edition, we opened it up to any brand of cell phone. So these are five-minute films, and uh, we uh, screened the winners, the top ten, and the winners uh, in Rockwell Cinema last year. And it was so surprising. The quality was so high. And since these are, many of them are youth or young, uh, they really touch the emotion of people. So it's not just climate change, you know, facts and figures, but really it's more of how people perceive climate. And uh, through this, we're hopefully uh, are able to make a difference uh, in the belief system, in the risk perception, and tagging the emotion, and therefore pushing them to uh, action. Okay, now we're UNDP, of course. Uh, uh, this is now shifting gear, and uh, UNDP gave us a small grant, uh, and then we work with DNR, and uh, so this is more of the impact. No? How can we make an impact? And uh, and of course, uh, how do we even assess those uh, impacts? And so, based on that study, uh, we, which we did, no, uh, thanks to UNDP support, uh, we were able to produce uh, some a report, of course. But more than that, that report was translated into DA, uh, DNR AO 2021-22. Uh, it became an administrative order. In other words, it, be it really had an impact in actual policy and hopefully action within the DNR. You know, and I think we need more. So this is not a lot of money, uh, Selva, no? this very small grant from, from you, UNDP. But uh, through this, and it, working with a government agency, you know, an NGO, civil society organization, like you, like me, if you are in an NGO, uh, can help as well. And so just sort of wrapping up here, uh, well, it's not just climate change, I'm glad. Uh, our speaker, Salva, also made that point. Uh, there's this uh, concept called planetary boundaries, for example, planetary health, looking at just uh, climate change. In fact, uh, the red there is genetic diversity, mentioned by Selva as well. Even phosphorus and nitrogen, maybe we're not paying attention to that. And these are dumped in our water systems uh, and, and others, no? uh, land use, land use change. So a lot of them are yellow, uh, if not red already. In other words, they're exceeding the boundaries, the threshold of safety, and these are planetary level indicators. It's not just one country or, or watershed, it's the whole planet that is at risk. And that is why we have to pay, to pay careful, careful attention to what's happening to our planet. And so, well, in behalf of our full crew of uh, OML seers, we call us ourselves perhaps, thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to interacting with you. Thank you, Dr. Lasco. That was a, it was, it's good to know that at least there's an action-oriented group doing uh, these uh, activities at, at the local level. Okay. So uh, let, me now, let us now hear from uh, our next discussant, Dr. Mirza Huda, who is a lead researcher at the Climate Change Southeast Asia Pro Program of the ISIS Use of ISAC Institute. So his research focuses on energy transition and climate change in Southeast Asia, the European Union carbon border adjustment mechanism, and cross-border electricity grids in, in Asia. So uh, Dr. Mirza is um, actually work with the Lee Kuan Yew uh, School of Public uh, Policy and uh, has been a recipient of the Clean Edge Asia Fellowship uh, uh, Foundation from the U.S. Department of State. Dr. Mirza, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bolesteros. Um, and thanks to PIDES for having me here. Um, 
So as Dr. Balasrois mentioned, I work at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute at the Climate Change in Southeast Asia program. And so today I would just like to share some of the findings of our landmark publication, which is the Southeast Asia Climate Outlook, which is based on a survey we undertake every year. So just a brief background on the survey. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing it every year since uh, 2021. So this is the uh, this is the fourth iteration, and uh, this is not meant to be a representative survey. This is only meant to identify and highlight the top of the mind issues when it comes to climate change. So it's a public perception survey, and we essentially uh, collect perceptions regarding climatic threats, food security, energy security, government policies from Southeast Asians in all 10 ASEAN countries. And so uh, this year, the survey was um, held between uh, July to August, and there were 39 questions in total, and we received around 3,000 respondents. And the, and the survey was offered in English, as well as um, various other Southeast Asian languages, such as Bahasa Indonesia, Lao, and Thai. And in terms of methodology, the survey uh, weighed its data through uh, the age and um, gender, as well as country population um, statistics. Uh, it was found by in, in studies by the United Nations or ASEAN. And there are some ex exceptions to such weightage. Um, so when it comes to the, um, the questions that focus on ASEAN's decision making, we use a 10% equal weightage for all, uh, question, for all the countries. And so I just wanted to mention that uh, in our experience with this survey, it is um, quite evident that Filipinos have very strong perceptions and great interest in participating in um, any sort of climate-related activities. And they're always in the top four of the country respondents in our survey. So it really is a great privilege and an honor to share some of these findings with my colleagues in, in the Philippines. So one of the questions that we always ask in our survey is um, what Southeast Asians feel about what, what their government is doing in terms of climate change. So we ask them to rank their perceptions regarding government action. And so this year we found that there has been a large increase in the number of people who think their government is essentially addressing climate change. So in 2021, only around 8% of the region's respondents believe that their government is uh, doing enough to address climate change, and this increased to more than 22% this year. And in terms of uh, looking at country-level data, we found that uh, the respondents in Singapore and Vietnam are most convinced about the fact that their government is addressing climate change, um, and so they believe that their government um, identifies the threat and also allocate sufficient resources and time and um, human and uh, technologies towards addressing this, this, this existential threat. And uh, we found that uh, Lao respondents feel that much more government action is needed, and while Philippine respondents are uh, more concerned about the allocation of resources, so they believe that the government is indeed uh, taking climate change seriously, but it, it's an issue of allocation of um, financial and human resources, which essentially is a regional issue. So we need around 200, mil more than 200 million per year up to 2050 to invest in green technology. So this is an issue that goes much more beyond the Philippines, but uh, there is much more awareness in the Philippines of this issue. So we have a more informed citizenry in this country. And we've also asked respondents about what they feel is their greatest climatic threats. So essentially, what do they think 
um, is the greatest impact. And um, we found that this year, floods, heat waves, and landslides are the top three climatic threats identified by regional respondents. And in the Philippines, uh, predictably, uh, tropical storms and floods are identified as the biggest threats. So we've seen floods in the Philippines uh, this year, and we also see floods in Vietnam as the, at the moment. So um, these are essentially reflections of lived experiences of climatic threats and extreme weather events. And heat waves are the top concern in Singapore, um, Thailand, Brunei, and Laos. And uh, as we know, 2023 was the hottest year on record. So this, once again, is just a reflection of what people are feeling. So we not only want to know how Southeast Asians are perceiving climate threats now, but also how they see climate impacting their future. So we asked them the question, and um, essentially we asked them to rank from a scale of 0 to 10, the threat perceptions of climate change in 10 years' time. So how do they think climate change will impact their lives in 20, uh, 2034? And we found that almost 60% of Southeast Asians believe that climate change will negatively impact their life in 10 years' time. So this essentially is identified as a very big threat going forward. And uh, it's recognized that climate change will only get worse. And once again, in the Philippines, um, around 72% of respondents feel that climate change will impact their lives greatly in 10 years' time. And we also asked respondents policy-relevant questions. So one of the issues uh, we want to identify is how do respondents feel about the challenges to decarbonization. So we always hear that um, you know, technological issues are not an not, uh, impediment, um, but we want to identify what people feel is stopping the acceleration of decarbonization. Yeah. And the top three identified challenges are lack of research and development, the lack of uh, public and private support, and insufficient financial resources. And uh, the lack of research and development and technology is uh, identified by respondents from Laos and Vietnam as having the greatest impact on decarbonization. And in these countries, we've seen that um, the lack of grid technologies, battery technologies, um, solar panel issues um, have impeded the jump to decarbonization. And in Thailand, the respondents believe that decarbonization is essentially impeded by other domestic priorities, such as economic priorities or political issues. And interestingly, in the Philippines, the lack of alternate energy resources is seen as the biggest challenge to decarbonization, which is essentially a misperception, because as we um, found out in the a very informative keynote speech today. Uh, Philippines has more than enough um, alternate energy resources, particularly geothermal, hydropower, as well as wind. So that is, um, you know, essentially the job of people like us, you know, think tankers, academics, to really get the information out there about the availability of resources uh, in, in the Philippines and Southeast Asia as a whole. And the issue of carbon tax is really gaining momentum in Southeast Asia. Singapore has already implemented a carbon tax and is thinking about increasing it. And there has been discussions about the economic and political challenges of implementing carbon tax in the region. So we wanted to know what respondents think about implementing a carbon tax, given that it will increase uh, prices of goods and services, but also put a price on uh, emissions, essentially. So around 46% regional respondents believe that um, their national government should implement a carbon tax. And respondents from Thailand, Vietnam, and Philippines are the strongest supporters of implementing a carbon tax, whereas um, Brunei respondents shows the greatest level of resistance uh, to implementing a tax. 
and fossil fuel subsidies essentially is uh, is a very um, is a very controversial. Um, sorry, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> sorry, I uh, let me just go back and correct the. Um, Sorry, I, I made a mistake in terms of um, explaining this, uh, the carbon tax. So um, essentially around 70% of regional respondents support a uh, national carbon tax, and the uh, strongest support comes from Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, whereas the highest opposition comes from Brunei, Cambodia, and Singapore. And um, we also collect data on the profiles of respondents. Uh, so we ask them things like age, occupation, um, and other uh, other data, and we found that there is a generational divide when it comes to a national carbon tax. So people in the 16 to 21 age group express a lot of negativity uh, in terms of a carbon tax, whereas people above 60 are more accepting of a carbon tax. And lastly, for, uh, fossil fuel subsidies are uh, are both an environmental issue as well as a just transition issue. So fossil fuel subsidies, uh, ha, they um, essentially perpetuate the use of dirty fuels, but they also cushion and protect uh, vulnerable communities from high energy prices. And um, we wanted to know what respondents think about cutting fossil fuel subsidies given the impact on the environment. And we found that um, around 46% of respondents believe that fossil fuel subsidies should be cut. And uh, response from Thailand and Vietnam um, are the strongest supporters of cutting fossil fuel subsidies, while Brunei respondents uh, shows the greatest level of resistance. And this is my last slide. Um, so we want to use this survey to also find out which country Southeast Asian citizens think is leading the global um, Paris Agreement goals. And so for the first time since uh, this survey was, was conducted in 2021, Japan has overtaken the United States and European Union to be seen as the leader in driving the Paris Agreement goals. Um, between 2021 and 2024, the perceptions of the United States as a leader has increased um, this is because the U.S. has rejoined the Paris Agreement, whereas perceptions of EU as a climate leader has decreased from 2021 to 2024, and this may have something to do with the ongoing conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And Japan was most favored by the Philippines, <coughs> Indonesia, and Brunei as a potential climate leader, whereas Vietnam, Myanmar, and Laos were most confident in U.S. leadership. So this is just a snapshot of the 39 questions in the survey. Um, sorry, I don't have enough time to actually go through all of them. But uh, the survey is available online. It's uh, free. There's no um, charge whatsoever. And all our publications are free. So if anyone is interested, please use the QR code to download the report. And I really look forward to the conversation and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mirza, and we will further unpack, I guess, the, the discussions or the uh, presentations that has been provided. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing with us the results of this survey, and somehow it is related to what uh, Dr. Lasko was, was uh, mentioned about the importance of community perception about climate change, the realization of uh, the risk, and I think shifting the mindset is one of the action uh, 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 that has to be uh, taken at the community and household level. So, okay. So, for our last but not least discussant, we have Dr. Marian or Anne de los Angeles. Uh, she was a far former senior research fellow of the PIDS that was a decade ago. <laughs> Decades ago. I'm not revealing your age, sorry for that. Uh, but now she's a board chairperson emeritus of the Resources Environment and Economic Center for, for Studies, that's uh, RICS. So Dr. Angeles is actually as the, our season natural resource and environment economist. She's the go-to person for national resource accounting. So she's a member of international communities, 
uh, committees, the Global Water Partnership uh, Sweden, the, Econo the Economy and Environment uh, Program for Southeast Asia, Environment and Development Economics at o Oxford University. And she has co-authored 32 publications and technical reports. So she earned her MA and PhD economics from the UP School of uh, Economics and a, a postdoctoral, it was a postdoctoral fellow in environmental economics at the University of Washington, Seattle, USA. So Dr. Uh, Ann, please. Yeah. You promoted me, I'm now a thing. <laughs> reflect on some of the suggestions from the previous speakers, particularly our main speaker, and uh, uh, introduce you to uh, natural capital accounting, uh, the potentials for that, and what still needs to be done beyond that in order to address our concerns on natural resource use, sustainability, climate action, and just transition. So um, we have many documents about climate uh, NDC, uh, about uh, climate action, and more recently about just transi transition. Uh, we also have documents uh, requiring local governments uh, to do local climate change action planning, uh, natural disaster risk uh, reduction, management planning, and so on. We are not lacking with respect to planning and anticipating but we uh, fail when it comes to monitoring what the effects of our actions are, what the effects of our expenditures on climate action have been, even if this is relatively more recent, and uh, more, more important, uh, what are those impacts with respect to the different um, disadvantaged groups of society. So we, we certainly need metrics and evidence in order to assess impacts and the effectiveness of climate action. So some of that evidence can come from the upcoming uh, information of the system, Philippine system of environmental economic accounting or, or the recently approved act, PENCAS, Philippine in, uh, Ecosystem uh, Natural Capital Accounting, uh, approved in March uh, by, by uh, by the legislative body. And uh, I will walk you through it so that you'll have an idea of what can be found uh, once the data are generated more regularly, because some of it had already been generated, and uh, what are the indicators that we could get from such information that would give us some idea about sustainability and climate action needed. So uh, the last two, natural capital accounting, and what are we still missing are, are uh, actually the meat of my discussion. Why NCA uh, already? It was alluded to that the GDP, uh, the common measure, which was devised in the 1920s as a result of the Depression, uh, needs to be supplemented with uh, other indicators. Not substituted for, you still need that, but we need to combine it with other indices. And, uh, the reason for that is the system of national accounts, which uh, generates our GDP uh, numbers, uh, misses some flows between the economy and the environment. And many of those flows are unmeasured, and in some cases, even if they are measured, they are not valued in economic terms properly. So on the left-hand side, you have the uh, Philippine uh, economy uh, embedded, the white circle, uh, where you have the economic actors, uh, households, goods and services, bought, uh, traded, industries, government, and the global economies interacting among themselves. Um, all these are embedded in the environment. So gone is the time when we would separate them. We accept that the environment hosts the, econo the economy. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, how does the environment interact with the economic sectors? You have uh, the arrows there that show that from the environment you, ca you can um, extract uh, 
Oh, sorry. Please go to the next slide. I sh I'll, I'll tell you next. Maybe you can just connect. It's supposed to be in that um, in that uh, thumb. So, nakita ang iba sa akin hindi. <laughs> so, um, the most obvious um, use values uh, are uh, those uh, that arise from the provisioning services of goods from the from nature. So these are the marketed, paid for uh, commodities that meet our basic needs, food, fuel, clothing, and shelter. So that is already in the accounts. But what are not in the accounts, we can go to the next one. Okay, what are not in the accounts, oops, before that, Okay. I must have accidentally erased Okay, so you can see my arrow, yeah. So these ones are marketed uh, goods and services, paid for. So they are monitored uh, through the GDP. We can just isolate uh, from the GDP what are natural resource-based uh, production and consumption. But uh, that's the provisioning services. But the cultural knowledge from natural resources, regulating services, climate regulation, hydrological functions and flows uh, and support, infrastructure for habitat, uh, they are not, they are hidden somewhere. We can see them, but not some of them are not tangible and more important, they don't necessarily pass through market transactions. So they benefit, uh, these services benefit us in one way or another, but we don't pay for them. So they are not reflected in the uh, income accounting. What are also not always reflected are the residuals 
or emissions into the air and discharges into land and water uh, that don't get uh, paid for through a pollution load-based fees or taxes. And uh, other values are also not necessarily reflected in the accounts. They include uh, option values, what we can use in the future by keeping some natural resource stocks intact. Uh, and the non-use values, we can enjoy and derive benefit by, from not using them, just by knowing that there's something unique uh, to the Philippines, like the eagle. And also, um, just knowing that something is existing, just knowing that others are benefiting, and this is where you have altruistic values, and you also uh, knowing that you can bequest uh, these. These are not necessarily reflected in market transactions. So as you go from here, there are some markets for these, there are incomplete markets for these, and no markets. So no markets, no measurements in the GDP. So the system of environmental uh, and e uh, economic accounting formulated uh, as a handbook in the early 90s. We helped experiment for one decade on uh, the numbers. Took 30 years for the debate internationally to happen. Many, many attempts to get it formalized. Finally, it was formalized in 2012 uh, here. So you have the central framework where the measurement of use of all these stocks of natural resources uh, is made explicit from timber, water, fish, soil, and minerals. From soil, you actually have um, agricultural crop production, and you can also have minerals uh, in the soils. No? But the more important, so this is being done by NEDA to some, by PSA to some extent. And there's a water accounts uh, recent, uh, last year, uh, but I won't have the time to go through that with you. But this is the part where uh, it's, it's a lot more intensive in data and knowledge. You need scientists to work with economists to do these measurements of ecosystem services. What, what are these? Uh, these are separate ecosystems by themselves. So within the forest, you have sub ecosystems, you have the mature forest, the grasslands, and all that. So there are interactions there. And also, among the different ecosystems, you also have interactions, all of which produce goods and services important to humanity. And these two need to be looked into explicitly. It's what uh, is good management of these, which is a necessary condition for preparedness against climate risk. Necessary, not necessarily, not always sufficient. And I'll go to the sufficient at the end of the discussion. So you have that, uh, it's already happening, and here are the indicators that can come out of those. Uh, of course, you have still the economic gross domestic product, income, income per capita, and others. For uh, the country, we do measure income distribution. They have some index for that. Um, there are some measurements of well-being, like health, and also the human development indicator and other uh, amenities. Um, there should be measures of risk, including climate risk. And those measures of risk are derived from different sources of information, from IPCC global models, downloaded to the region, downloaded to the Philippines by Pagasa. Okay. And of course, there's market and political risk. So other important thing to note is that wealth and sustainable development needs to be looked into in a more concrete manner. The source of income for all of us comes from all our assets. Our assets, you and I, include our physical ownership of our cars and houses, our health, our education, that's human resource, the natural resource we are, we are accessing, our relationship with the community, that's social capital. So it's how we manage those assets together that allow us to move into the future. And so one needs to measure that, and one can measure total wealth by looking at the concept of saving and dissaving. Uh, in financial terms, what, have, what you have in the bank 
uh, you can withdraw or you can keep in the bank and it can grow interest-wise. Um, if you remove everything you are de-saving, there's nothing for the future. If you save, there's something for the rainy day. So that is the concept of coming up with a measure like genuine savings or adjusted net savings. It is supposed to uh, lead us to a measure of sustainability through time. It is a composite indicator of services from all these assets. Here is how such measure was attempted. And in that measure, um, you can see it okay. So there is a net savings that is uh, measured regularly in our income accounts. But you need to modify that to include the following. You need to include uh, consumption of fixed capital, or the depreciation of your machinery and man-made capital, your house, your car, and all that. If it doesn't get repaired, it depreciates, so it's not as available in the future. Um, you can also have Natural resource depletion, that is measured through natural capital accounting. We did measure that for the Philippines some time ago, more than 10 years ago, and now it is being remeasured given the new system of the approved, internationally approved standards for measurement. Um, we, are, we have measured that for mineral resources. Uh, the PSA, when I say we, it's the PSA and NEDA has done that. Uh, we have not done it for fisheries. I'm trying to do the framework for fisheries and coral reefs now, but data there is much more difficult to handle. Um, and uh, pollution damage is measured very impartially. Um, so what does this show? Um, there are pluses and minuses adjusted with the original indicator savings. The pluses in particular are investments in education. When you invest, build your human capital, your skills, and invest in health maintenance, you are making yourself productive in the future. So that's the idea of keeping your human resource um, uh, up to par. If you don't, if you are going to be um, overtaken by IT um, developments, if you don't know how to do AI, and your skills are not able to adjust to the changes in the energy mix, then you become obsolete. So there is the need to do skills investment. Okay? And then uh, there are others that are missing for the moment, fisheries and pollution damage. But what this shows, is that there is uh, the, the adjusted net savings um, moves uh, up, not so bad then for the Philippines, but can we do better if we want to grow at 8%, which was the discussion this morning? We probably do. And you have to be mindful of the fact that these estimates were based on previous um, trends. We did not, nobody has done any estimate yet that includes climate risk. So this could change drastically if you think of climate risk. So um, what are the principles that we need to invoke when we get numbers from the NCA? Um, if there is revenue, in net terms, some exhaustible natural resources like minerals, uh, you just have to prepare for the time in the future when you don't have minerals anymore. You run out of it. And how do you, how do, you do that? You cannot sustain mineral-based activity, but you can sustain income from mining if you use that income and invest it wisely in other assets that will continue to yield income in the future. So that needs to be tracked. And the uh, Transparency Initiative is doing that, but not all uh, mining companies are members of EITI, and only the large ones for the moment are members of EITI, so that needs to be improved. Um, but there are also other items that we need to track. Income from mining is shared with LGUs, share of natural wealth. Where is the money, uh, the revenue that LGUs receive going 
we did a little bit of looking into that. Um, unfortunately, many LGUs in the past, hopefully not in the future, um, are more concerned with uh, very visible projects like, you know, flagpoles and um, uh, shade, uh, sheds, uh, social centers or basketball courts. And uh, they should do more than that. They should invest in helping their uh, human resource uh, improve themselves. They should also invest in climate uh, adaptation measures. And uh, that's a tall order because climate adaptation is a long-term, medium-term, long-term uh, process. Uh, climate um, disaster aversion is more short term, and you can see the result right away. But the longer term and more long lasting effects are more difficult to entice the LGUs to invest in. Not to mention the fact that uh, many LGU, LGUs are short lived in their perspective because of the three year uh, political lifespan. Uh, for renewable natural resources, there is uh, room for reinvesting, infusing, and that term used this morning was infusion back to the uh, SMEs that would allow uh, continuous production from natural resource-based um, activities like fishing, um, aquaculture, uh, and the like, and also the use of water. Since this needs tracking by uh, natural resource users and the other stakeholders because there are what we call the externalities associated with the use of these natural resources. And therefore, uh, it's the responsibility of government to, at the minimum, look at the welfare of the other stakeholders. We also need to invoke principles of sustainability, strong sustainability and weak sustainability. Strong is when you really have a minimum uh, level of all these assets together because you accept that uh, not they cannot always be substituted for one another. Uh, weak when you accept that you can substitute for the other. So it really uh, is a case-to-case -case basis uh, and empirical work has to be done to look into this. Uh, examples of that are protecting the remaining mangroves is an expression of strong sustainability. Um, the weak sustainability is when you allow for biodiverse areas to be decimated by an economic activity and you uh, have investments elsewhere, what is called biodiversity offsets. Very difficult to replicate biodiversity. Okay. So questions to be looked into when we do policy analysis using data. How important is natural capital to the economy? How much should be invested? Uh, 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 from the different sources of revenue that are not resource based. But there are efforts at uh, looking into these values. Here are the different values. And um, these efforts uh, I, I, I are re repeated in this next slide where I enumerate the examples of the empirical work that had been done in the Philippines. Uh, we are among the pioneers for doing such empirical work, and I mean not just RICs, but RICs working with academics. Uh, we have a, a, an association co called Environment and Economic Group, uh, and associated also, of course, with the funders and the clients, DNR and LGUs. Um, of all these that were enumerated, only three, I am, I am um, embarrassed to say that, only three account for climate uh, risk. So we still have a long way to go to look into using the NCA to account for climate risk. The reason why we need researchers to do that is PSA will not do such an analysis. It's not their mandate. It is the mandate perhaps of PIDS, academics, researchers, development agencies. And in fact, such, such analysis has been done by the recent World Bank report on climate action needed for the country. But it's a partial report because it does not include coastal resources and marine, the marine economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, there are such studies. There are uh, people who can do this, and not just economists. We work with natural 
scientists, uh, engineers, and also sociologists. So it is uh, the, the, the knowledge is there, not only in, uh, in Manila, but in local universities, you can tap them. So there are such evaluation initiatives, and I mentioned these and who are doing it. And I also mentioned that um, the national statistical system is quite important source. We have several information sets, including CBMS, Community-Based Monitoring System. But it's not done uh, regularly, nor processed uh, in time for analysis. This is my experience in some local government units. And so a lot needs to be done. And um, we do estimates that can give us an idea of who is sharing benefits, who is uh, bearing the costs of natural resource-based activities, but this is not happening very regularly. We need to do a lot more of this if we are interested in just transition. So the extensions of the NCA or SEA should look at uh, decomposing the values to the stakeholders, net returns, whether you're talking about a project, an assessment of a technology, like uh, decarbonization technologies, uh, reforestation or conservation technologies, and management options. Should it be a single proprietor? Should it be community-based? I think those need to be looked into. They have different capacity to give returns, and they also they entail different what you call transactions costs and contracting costs. So it is important that we go beyond financial analysis, but we also look into social benefit cost analysis with environmental transition uh, valuation to do transition analysis uh, empirically. Uh, we did that for El Pepechea uh, through a grant from Jeff and B uh, DNR, and uh, that needs to be updated. Um, we also subsequently, after you have the numbers, develop the payoff matrix or the compensation. There will always be those who will get hurt. But if you are not discussing with them beforehand your plans and getting uh, some agreement, there will be a political unrest. And this is what has happened with our e jeepneys. No? Uh, it, it has not been accepted totally because. The, the preparation, I have, to, I have to say this, was very uh, short-timed short, short -timed and uh, time-framed and uh, very less, uh, didn't rely too much on uh, what we, we now call co-creative uh, measures. No? We have to co-create the solutions. Uh, so the information systems, my last conclusion, have talked with each other. Uh, even within DNR, the, the data sets are not necessarily compatible. We researchers have to spend a lot of resources to get them together. Uh, and also um, information from Namria, uh, which is where we should get uh, for our spatial analysis because ecosystem accounting is spatial analysis. We get the pictures of the maps, but they are not manageable. They are not shaped what they call shape files, they are JPEG. And it's such an effort to, to we, we end up using pictures of uh, shape files from others, from the universities elsewhere. But when it comes to official uh, maps, we still have to rely with Namria. Okay? So we need to also enhance these scientific information with social science, including citizen monitoring. This is happening in terms of our coral reef assessments and uh, uh, some fish um, monitoring. And uh, uh, so of course, we should learn from independent evaluation. So to transition justly into better paths of using natural resources, we need all these information and we need to work together. Thank you. Hi, uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Ann, for walking us through the concept of environment is the economy and the efforts that go through the process of uh, resource accounting. So are, are we still all awake? 
Okay. Yes, so it's now your time or our time to engage our discussants and speakers. So uh, may I call our speakers to please occupy the seats in front? Yes. So, um, please prepare your questions. So the the floor is open for uh, question and answer. So probably I will throw the first questions. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Let. Uh, please state your name and affiliation, and uh, before you s uh, state your question. Good afternoon. Hello. First and foremost, I'd like to, to thank the organizer for organizing this very important topic for today. And I'm Jerome Bunye. I am the director of the Policy Research Service of the Department of Agriculture. My question may not necessarily reflect the questions of the department, but nevertheless, it's very important uh, for my work. Now, uh, if I may just point the first question to uh, uh, Dr. De Los Re Angeles. First and foremost, thank you very much, ma'am. You have. I'm sure you have enormity of knowledge that you capsulize everything into a uh, very simple and, and, and enjoyable presentation. But just on the, the challenges in terms of environmental accounting is the same challenges how you value agriculture. And uh, the problem with, uh, of course, our topic is expanding the middle class. Uh, I was surprised that we're ta talking about middle income trap when our problem is very basic. No? And if I could just point back to the accounting, according to PIDS study, only 40% of the population is the middle class. And about 58% is actually the poor. And agriculture is the, is, belongs to that bottom 30% of the population, if not among the poorest of the poor. So going back to environmental accounting, uh, of course, you cannot say no to the climate change in the environment. You have to adapt. You have to develop productions and uh, production and process methods that will uh, ensure the sustainability of the ecosystem and agriculture in general. The question is, are we ready for really valuation in terms of would the consumers really value the real environmental social accounting of, of, of the value of the products because because we are still struggling to expand the middle class and in the Department of Agriculture we always have this pressure that you know uh, we think that food security is we need to depress the price for our farmers which I will discuss later on in the panel which is not necessarily serving the long-term food security objectives in the same manner for uh, environmental accounting, which is very important, would our consumers or even the top, the middle class above, let alone leave the, the poor people, the 60% of the people, would be ready to pay the price for the real environmental economic cost of what they pay? Uh, in Europe, of course, uh, they have started this. But the question is, if the market is not ready, how can you then backward engineer and, and account it? And, ma'am, I know you for quite a long time. I was still junior. I was doing the UNDP impact, uh, I call that action impact matrix. And we always need to have this environment accounting. Ma'am, my hair is getting, <laughs> turning gray. <laughs> and I still like your presentation, but the question remains. Are uh, we are ready for that. Would the consumer pay for the right uh, environment and uh, economic accounting? Thank you. Thank you. A very important question and a very key to uh, the work of environmental economists. Two things. Uh, economically valuing means estimating the economic values that are not revealed in the market. But there are behavioral uh, actions that actually imply that you are already paying a price, but not explicitly. So if you have to buy what bottled water instead of... Uh, rely on the piped water uh, or uh, and, and so on. 
also there are studies that show that people are willing to pay provided that it's contingent upon improvements by the managers of the resource. So improvements by protected area managers uh, and so on. So where do we start? Uh, we did start some time ago um, when we valued 10 parks. And I'm, I don't mean just we, I mean B Bureau of uh, Biodiversity Management, Bureau of DNR, did uh, user pricing for water users Pawai Lake, uh, and so on. Eight out of the 10 successfully increased access price to these protected areas. Uh, and people did pay. Uh, Pulag was one of them, uh, Inulogang Tak Tak, and the like. That was the good news uh, 20 years ago. It was supposed to be reviewed every now and then, but it took so long for DNR to review it and update it. Uh, it was an EO, not, not a tax. So an, an EO is to us more favorable because you can update. You, know, you don't need a protracted legislative process. And also we have to learn from these uh, because uh, uh, other countries did it that way too. Uh, China uh, had its green gold payments a long time ago. Uh, in their lowest plateau, they, had, uh, they bulldozed the mountains to come up with plateau a rice terrace type, but they planted not rice, but uh, tree crops in orchards. And they learned from the earlier payments uh, and mo uh, remodeled them. So we should not, uh, uh, we should not uh, be uh, coward, cowards or shy about experimenting, provided that the learning process is done together among the different stakeholders. So we do have such experience in Mount Kitanglad, KitKat. Uh, there are payments by uh, water utilities. Uh, it's, the payments are handed by, handled by Xavier University. Part of the payments are uh, sent over to, for the forest guards and the communities. But uh, that was the good news. Uh, I looked at it recently, kulang pa to really restore the two mountains. Uh, the payments are not substantial enough because not all LG, not all water utilities are paying. Um, there is another one, Bago Watershed, uh, uh, payments by extractors from the groundwater. And the reason why that was done uh, in a, an easier way was there was a JICA assisted project that really looked at groundwater modeling and that showed that, you know, the the battling companies and the other utilities were, uh, and the utilities were uh, overdrawing the groundwater. So if you don't control the extraction, you can have subsidence, you can also have uh, um, infiltration of pollutants because there's uh, gaps, and uh, you can have a, uh, no more water uh, in the far future. Uh, and part of the, some of the studies show that part of the sinking of some cities is because of subsidence, overdrawing groundwater in some of these cities. So question, uh, do you relocate the people in these cities? Do you have other stopgap stop measures like uh, restoring some of the aquifers? Is that possible? Also, all this remains to be seen empirically. So we need to do our homework together with the engineers and the like. So are we ready for payments for ecosystem services? I think that is really your uh, basic question. And I'd say that uh, in the countries that did try it, they were already in high growth mode. So kumero ng capacity, pwede na. Don't do it when we are still very poor. Nobody will pay anyway. But when people realize that maybe it's better to pay because if I don't pay, I will hurt more, then we can start slowly and expand it, scale up. So I think we are ready for some areas. Thank you. I, I would also like to get the thoughts of uh, Dr. Lasco on this because you mentioned about community engagement in this climate action as well, I, I guess, uh, shifting the mindset. So somehow, is uh, I, I think you could provide some uh, answers to the questions. Well, yeah. Well, the ans answer was, uh, of course, very comprehensive. But uh, 
and in fact, we were together in one organization <laughs> before, and I sort of took over what she left. And well, just quickly, uh, yeah, I think there is uh, room for uh, for this, no? And uh, I think our local communities, once they see the value of this, and especially if you're the one, for example, in the upland, uh, taking care of the forest, the watershed, uh, and you will benefit from this, uh, for sure you will be open no, to this kind of idea. And if, if, if you're in a downstream area, as mentioned again by Anne earlier, if you think you will benefit by improved services, then you, you may, they will be open to such uh, compensation or payments or rewards uh, and so on. So yeah, I just want to support what Anne mentioned. Thank you uh, so much. What about Dr. Mirza? Was there a result from your perception survey about the uh, willingness to pay for? Uh, um, well, we did ask the question why people are interested in doing away with fossil fuel subsidies. So those who chose yes, we want to cut fossil fuel subsidies, they had uh, a list of things they could choose from to justify their, their reason. And the most popular choice was we want to divert um, resources from fossil fuel subsidies to programs that make uh, communities resilient to climate change. So I think uh, you know, we see people's willingness to pay for um, you know, the real cost of energy, the real cost of um, food, water, but uh, it's very important as to what happens to you know the added you know, the added resources. You know when you take away resources from um, fossil fuels, where do you actually divert it towards? Um, you know if you divert it towards resilience, if you divert it towards um, community development, then people are more willing to pay for that. So um, before I call in another one, maybe I could ask a question for Dr. Selva. So actually, if you look at climate change investments, this require huge investments. And what would be the possible financing mechanisms, for instance, for developing countries that are um, faced with huge and structural uh, uh, fiscal imbalances? So based on experience. Yep, and also can be a bit more direct and frank as well. Huh? <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, uh, it, the issue of climate justice is key. I mean, that's where the whole debate starts. Who pays, who receives, and, uh, and, and it, there's no agreement. There's no agreement on that. Uh, if we keep arguing on that, I think there will not be a solution, right? Somebody polluted more than somebody else. You did not pollute as Philippines, but you see 20 typhoons every year and it becomes in, becoming more and more stronger. So. You should be the recipient from the climate justice, but is the world is ready for that kind of ecosystem? The discussion keep going on, right? COP is meeting every year, discussion going on, but there is no clear solution. But some of the things can be looked at it more uh, uh, carefully. That's also the reason I had a side, uh, uh, side note in my presentation. At the end of the day, you have to do what you have to do as a country. Your own resource mobilization, internal resource mobilization, is the one going to help you more than what you're going to get uh, elsewhere. We do have, at the moment, uh, uh, financing at a global level, vertical fund, there's a green climate fund. Well, my God, to access the green climate fund, it's not easy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We have a global environment facility. We do, F, uh, do, do access for Philippines. That's where, that's where some of the small, small things goes here. But I think, for, for in my per perspective, the notion of multilateral development banks, how they were set up, the whole financing arrangement, that need to be relooked into it, right? The model uh, need to be relooked into it, and can they be more uh, oriented towards uh, the needs of the country, on the human needs, on the human climate impact of the country? I think that's something we could we could look into it. But I hope, uh, see, as we speak, between now and December, the three cops. Biodiversity COP, desertification COP, and climate change COP. Uh, hope, you know, we should not give up hope. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we can continue. But mo one more, probably the important thing is how do we harness and work together with private sector? That would be another way. And if you are becoming uh, uh, 
uh, aspirant of uh, upper middle income country, the role of private sector also will become crucial. Thank you for that uh, response from our discussants. So any more? Ah, oh, yeah, Sani. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Ballesteros. Uh, congratulations to our presenter as well as our discussants. Interesting presentations. My, um, well, top of mind, you've um, given weight to our concerns about climate change, the negative impacts of climate change, the importance of climate action. Uh, and that's very apparent given all the examples mentioned, as well as, of course, the global sentiments presented by Mirza. Um, what stuck with me was also part of the presentation of Dr. Lasco. Uh, he mentioned our other concerns. So aside from climate change, we have more urgent concerns when it comes to genetics, probably biodiversity, um, land use, and our concerns about water pollution may be related to agriculture because we are polluting with supposedly uh, the over-application of fertilizer. So a lot more concerns compared to what we are, well, focusing right now. Is that an over-obsession? Are we focusing too much on climate change, climate impact, supposed climate action, and then trying to rationalize government action? Mirza uh, probably discredited a bit of that because he mentioned that the government of the Philippines actually is quite aware in terms of climate change and the impacts of climate change, but we're not seeing enough in terms of action. So that may be um, the caveat no? in terms of us maybe looking at government over-focusing on climate change and not focusing too much on the other concerns. So is that a valid uh, observation? Is that a valid assessment of the different presentations as well? Are we looking too much, justifying supposedly our, our focus on climate change and related uh, climate action, and not really focusing enough on the more urgent, because you've mentioned, Dr. Lasco, that these other concerns are actually more urgent, uh, being in the red compared to climate change related matters. Thank you. Who do you want to answer first? <laughs> I think it's a Actually, question for the... All of them can yeah. answer, but I think uh, Dr. Lasco should uh, take the first shot. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's the million-dollar question there. Well, I presented the planetary boundaries concept, planetary health conce concept, just to sort of put this in the right framing or context. And so the idea is that we have many other problems and challenges. Some, in fact, are more urgent than <laughs> climate change. Now. My own uh, work is on climate change for the past 25 years, so I'm sort of biased towards climate change. But uh, I, I probably have to include not just SDGs, but even the next iteration of the SDGs as the other side, because these are more biophysical, planetary boundaries uh, type of uh, framing. But on the other side, we have the social, economic, and other, um, you know, other uh, multilateral agreements that should also be considered as well. And so, uh, well, just like a typical professor, it's a long answer to say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Uh, are we over, uh, you know, over committing or over discussing climate change? Uh, I, I probably don't know. But what I can say is, compared to 25 years ago, there's hardly any discussion on climate change. Now, 25 years later, there is much more. There's much more awareness. But does it mean we are doing what we should do? My answer is probably no. There's a lot of discussion, but real action on the ground is still lacking. But vis-a-vis -vis the other challenges, wow, that's a difficult question. Maybe our plenary speaker and uh, Selva or Mirza or Anne can take a crack. Um, I, I give you a comparison of uh, Mother Teresa's approach and Martin Luther King's approach. Mother Teresa, says, people are dying now. I need to help them now. Otherwise, there's no tomorrow. That's one approach. Martin Luther King, I have a dream. 
if these uh, things doesn't fix, you know, the whole issue of humanity, then your dream will not uh, come together. I think this has to come together. Yeah. To me, uh, I'm not going to argue and challenge the numbers that I'm seeing. The scientific numbers are really talking, and I, I believe in that numbers. And I also travel to Pacific. When I travel to Pacific countries, that's where I really see the impact of climate change. It's a matter of life and death. Whether you have a country <laughs> in existing, existence or you're wiped out. That's a question, right? Uh, of course, Philippines, you have under 10 million population. You have uh, many uh, uh, different demands. Uh, uh, the government is in a challenging position. Uh, oh, but climate change will affect the whole issues. Right? One typhoon Yolanda, what's the cost, the impact of it? $5 billion. One typhoon uh, uh, audit, I, I don't get the number, but it may not be as big as a typhoon under, but at least $2 billion. Your cost is huge. Yeah. So therefore, some level of investment, and it doesn't become a sense of urgency, a priority for the country, you will pay a very heavy price. That, that's how I see it. Thank you, Dr. Blesteros, for that very... Uh, Difficult question. Um, so I guess in uh, Southeast Asia, it's always um, bread and butter issues. You know, um, so when you think about uh, trade-offs, it's always um, you know how much money can you invest in climate change and how much can you invest in in development in line with the theme of this, this conference. So um, we also do another survey. And this is a state of Southeast Asia survey. And in that survey, we asked people, what are your biggest threats you know, overall? Um, what are you most concerned about? And livelihoods and jobs always come up on top, you know, even more so than climate change. Um, and in terms of really looking into the impacts, just transition issues, when we ask people, what are your fears regarding transition, it's always um, livelihoods um, and rising energy prices and things like inequality. So um, I guess the, the key issue um, is not so much whether we are focusing too much on climate change, but how can we kind of um, bring the economic bread and butter issues together with our climatic um, concerns. And so, the, of course, as uh, Dr. Silva mentioned, you know, the, the private sector needs to play a very big role, um, and um, the governments and the communities need to come together. But um, it, of course, boils down to issues like the Just Energy Transition Partnership, issues like the, uh, the transfer of funds from the developed to the developing economy is being done in a, you know, much more faster, much more efficient and fair way. So that's really, I, I hope I managed to uh, address your, your question. But thank you for that very important question. Thank you for our discussions, those responses. So any more questions from the audience? Yes, please. So I am Giovanni Villaperte. I'm a public finance specialist from UNICEF. But like the gentleman from DA, my, my opinions are my own and not, and not that of uh, the, agency, the agency I am in. So I am, uh, I am rather confused and I'm receiving mixed, mixed messages. Uh, I would be delighted to be enlightened. No? So we want to uh, avoid the middle income trap by at least growing by 6.5% no? to achieve to become like China. But uh, I believe uh, Dr. Angelis is saying this is an environmental cause. So what does it got to give? Uh, environment, uh, growth in, in the, um, that's detrimental to the environment or, or climate change, sacrificing growth, or what has to give? Or is there a way out? Or do we even have to consider the growth? Or, uh, y yeah, what's, uh, what's the middle point? Or is there a middle point, really? Thank you. I'm sure there's a middle point. Who wants? 
It's not an either or thing. It's the pattern and composition of growth. Uh, you can grow, but not in the old way, where we disregarded pollution, we disregarded over extraction of water and forests. We have to change uh, the way we do things. So good natural resource management is important by itself. It allows you to distribute benefits to those who are protecting the environment. Bad natural resource management uh, exacerbates the impact on the poor when there is climate change. So I don't think we have a choice, and I think we should really just, I'm pragmatic, uh, take advantage of uh, incremental additional funds from the climate funds to supplement local government monies while we are not growing it much yet, to supplement the small private sector investments. But once these other two grow, then we don't have to uh, call on uh, increasing our foreign debt in the future anymore. But we need some seed money to get the action going and to let our pilot efforts scale up. Because we do have some successful efforts, but they're too small and uh, too small that we don't even notice or sometimes you forget that we did this uh, in the past. So we need to really have a critical mass of doers uh, and that will need considerable incentives and, and, and financing. Thank you. Any response from the other discussants? I, I fully agree. Uh, I think it's the growth model plays an important role. What kind of growth model? Uh, we have learned the lessons from elsewhere in the world. And as that's also what I was mentioning. Asia Pacific is growing too fast, but it's not a sustainable growth model. I think that needs to be thought through carefully. Yeah? If not, the impact of that, what you will pay eventually, will be far more than uh, your growth rate. I, I think government is fully aware, and I think that's a direction uh, uh, they also are looking into it. Uh, some sacrifices have to be made, a circular economy, becomes a very important thing. Otherwise, our old uh, fashion of doing things is we use and we throw, we use and we throw. But we have to be more circular now. Some things can be reused. Uh, we can uh, look at the different conceptual uh, thinking. These are all new economic models that's coming up, right? And Philippines uh, can benefit. Certainly, that can, re can create a lot more employment opportunity. And certainly, you can sustain your growth rate as well. Not necessarily... You, you shift a little bit to different uh, ways of doing your growth rate is going to come down. I, I don't believe in that. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to apologize because I was thinking I'm going to get lost in translation because most of you are policymakers, researchers. Mom, uh, kay Dr. De Los Angeles, I work in the local government po. And I'm really interested kasi because you were explaining about LCCAP and the DRMO plan, I've been in legislation, I'm the vice mayor of my town, and I observed that all these documents are only requirements so that we can approve our budget actually. Even in the local government level, uh, I have observed that in fact, the LC Cup are just requirements for us for the approval of the budget, and I have been looking at the documents. Uh, there are unrealistic uh, items that sometimes we question them, but because we don't prepare it, rather than the, <coughs> the local, the MDRMO prepare it, so we just go by it because they said, you just submit it, pass it, and legislate it, and after that, uh, we, 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 we do all the things. So my question is, in terms of support, we are always asking for support from the private sector, especially private research organization. For example, my locality, we, we live in a very unique situation. We are surrounded by the Pacific Ocean in the east and another big body of water, the Lagunoy Gulf on the west. And we have a very, very uh, vast forest resources. That's why, considering all those factors, we know that uh, our locality has very, very fragile uh, 
climat uh, climactic condition. And we are situated in the Bicol region where we are always the victim of tropical uh, the typhoons and flooding. So what we would like is, if it is possible, uh, to ask the support from the private research organization to support us also in crafting policies that would help in at attaining a real and applicable uh, environmental policies that could support our locality. Your first question. Your second question, tataas tayo sa macro level. Now we are in the budget season sa Congress, and I know that PIDS uh, has been very, very focal uh, support in terms of research policies and providing them with data that, uh, that they need so that they can create the budget for this year or even during the previous years. I have been observing that during the privilege or the sponsorship speech of the proponent, they prioritize education and infrastructure. But my question is, they always put a very, very big chunk of amount in this infrastructure, uh, climate mitigation infrastructures. And to all those who know, especially uh, sa DPWH, these are flood mitigating infrastructure. Siguro naalala nyo, uh, yung mga nandito, during the flood a few weeks ago, after the sauna of the president, and he was bragging about the flood mitigating infrastructure. Did it, had it has the support of the P, uh, PDI, uh, yeah? Na ganun talaga, PIDS pala, <laughs> na ma-implement yung mga flood mitigation structure. Kasi parang, for me, it's just one way to maximize the chunk of the fund. Kasi what they are telling right now is actually the truth, that they are using the flood mitigating structures, the road. Kasi si Dr. Habito even told us about yung reblocking. Just the same po. Yun na-observe namin talagang ganun. We are for climate, mitiga uh, climate change mitigation, but the allocation of the resources is very, very not uh, uh, dependent o makakasupport para ma 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 mitigate yung climate uh, change na nangyayari sa atin po. Thank you. Maybe I respond to the PIDS thing first. <laughs> Actually, PIDS do not, do not approve projects, no neda yon. But what I I I gathered, it 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 goes through a process of feasibility studies yan. So those flood control projects are very necessary. Ang issue lang don minsan is the delay, kasi nga road right of way, and of course I I, I think we accept na yung environment natin. We are almost at the tipping point, eh. so uh, that's also one of the questions that comes comes out. Eh, na, uh, what is the low lying fruit, and how do we balance balance this? Yung, because I I've read about nature based solutions, uh, but this takes time, no? It's a long term solution. So, but the the problem is there already. We are uh, experiencing it. So. Um, flood control could be, I know, but it has to be done in a, um, in a faster way, I guess, and and complementary to other um, to other projects of the government. And for me, I think this is my uh, one of the issues really is the built community. So if you look at how we build our uh, on on our land, yung, I think there should be some clear le legislation or the implementation of the law should be very uh, strict with regards to built environment. That's, that's from my own uh, reflection <laughs> of what was happening, especially in Metro Manila, for, for the uh, recent flooding. So may I ask now our discussants for the <laughs> response to the, what was the first, to the other questions? Uh, uh, I'm just asking if we can, the, the local governments can also seek support from, especially from UNDP, and other agencies that could provide us with other uh, more viable information rather than just depending on some government support. We have ongoing uh, uh, support to Department of uh, Interior and Local Government, uh, specifically 
two flagship program with the uh, Department of Interior and Local Government. One is on resilience. Uh, resilience, and this is, uh, I mean, it's not a huge program. Eh? It's $16 million program supported by Australia to work in 11 provinces, Metro Manila, and BAM to help uh, 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 these provinces to come out with the uh, uh, capacity building measures and forward looking issue on all resilience. The more we help that, I see a very good opportunity to link that to the loss and damage fund. Because for loss and damage fund, you already start thinking eh, what kind of, when the fund flows where you should go. Uh, so that's how we are looking into it. That's number one. Number two, uh, we just launched a reasonably a sizable program with the EU funding, $25 million to, sub we call it green LGUs. Basically, circular economy in green LGUs. And I can say, I, I see my colleagues from Department of Science and Technology, they are here. They have a big program also on circular economy. DTI have a big program on circular economy. We are working with DNR, and this particular component is implemented through DILG. And for a start, it will focus on 20 primary LGUs, plus 40 LGUs, and the whole idea is also to work with private sector to support uh, uh, enabling environment policy, uh, investment into that. At least that two things I could, I could mention, and this is directly with the Department of Interior and Local Government. Anyone else? Who? Um, Mr. Vice Mayor, I sympathize with uh, your angst. I'm assisting uh, through a, an NGO called P uh, Partnership for Transparency Fund Asia, uh, Iriga City, uh, with their request. But, uh, to, re to reformulate their uh, proposal to the People's Survival Fund to reduce flooding uh, in the city. We but uh, Iriga is not a coastal city, so it does not qualify with any of these assistance that are more for urgent uh, areas. But we didn't succeed in two uh, proposals, so uh, we think now that we should break it up because our proposal was Okay, if you want to reduce flooding, you do uh, drainage uh, cleanup, irrigation canal uh, maintenance, uh, actually change some of the road, the way the roads were built. We did modeling and we said, okay, some of the water comes from Lake Buhi, so then you have to look at that too. And then, of course, the upland uh, areas of Mount Asog uh, need to be rehabilitated. So the budget became a very big budget. And so it, it wasn't funded, and maybe it, if it has to be funded, it has to be a loan, and I'm not sure if local government units are ready for a large loan. So, so it will have to be broken up. Now, going to the infrastructure, uh, that was the complaint of Dr. Habito earlier, and also my complaint, because I used to travel a lot to Cagayan de Oro to uh, Bukidnon, and all the time, for four years, I was traveling. The same side, part of the road gets repaired. And so I, ins I looked into the blue book of the DPWH. It was uh, new, newly, um, the standards were new then. Because of climate change, they had to change the standards. And I noticed that, uh, yes, some of the specifications had changed, but the computations on erosion, silt loads, were somewhere, were nowhere. And I thought, isn't this a basic thing? Uh, you uh, either compute for the silt and therefore the frequency of the silting and also the size of the culverts. And so maybe I was missing something and maybe 10 years after it has changed. I brought this up with a fellow economist at the School of Economics who has been analyzing the budget, uh, the climate expenditure tagging. And she said, you know, uh, and um, some people have told me that it's okay if they keep on repairing because that's employment generation. I, well, my, my face really fell because what a way of gener generating employment. Parang the easy way. No? We should prepare for better roads before the rains come, and that's what they do in some countries. And then you can build more roads elsewhere or pay labor to do some other work. So it, it should not be an escape. No? So. There's really a lot that we need to do. And uh, for the local governments, it's not only just the nationally built roads, but also your local roads that need to be looked into. Thank you.
Can I just add uh, uh, in relation to these people uh, survival fund? Eh? I must say, not many countries have such kind of mechanism. You should be proud. But uh, whether it's really working is another question. The utilization rate is very low. So uh, Department of Finance has requested us to re-review the whole people survival fund to make it far more friendlier. So we can also see eh, that uh, this kind of uh, uh, proactive measures is taken. So we are working with Department of Finance now to relook at the whole uh, streamline the whole people survival fund. It will take a little bit time because you have to do a lot of consultation. But I hope that will help also LGUs uh, uh, like you. Okay, so I know you still have some uh, questions probably in mind, but I was just uh, notified by our timekeeper that it's time to wrap up. So uh, please uh, join me in congratulating our uh, speakers. Yes, and thank you everyone for your uh, lively and engaging discussions. Uh, as a reminder, please, we still have a closing plenary, so we have to go back to the... Uh, Isabella Hall, and before you go, we'll have a photo ops with our uh, uh, speakers uh, right now, yes. Uh.